Welcome to Coffee and Poets, uh, a uh, monthly interview program here at Naked Lounge at 11th and H. Uh, this program is produced by Ensa A. Lawrence Dinkins. Today's May 18th, 2014. My name is Bob Stanley, and I am here with Jan Haig, poet, publisher, prose writer, journalist, and teacher here in Sacramento. Um, and I have so many questions for you, Jan. Um, I'm just a big fan of your work and the work you do with so many other people. Um, but let me start with maybe beginnings. What was it that got you into poetry or that kind of, uh, what was your first inspiration uh, with poetry? My mother says that I was writing as soon as I could hold a pencil. And I suspect most of those early works were <laughs> little stories and poems, honestly. that um, The consensus in my family, which are all very left-brained people, uh, was this, this strange child, was the literary one, was the writer, was the poet, was the creative one in the, in the bunch from very early on. And I remember um, sitting in an oak tree out at my parents' house in what is now called Granite Bay, but when I was growing up there it was just the sticks, um, writing in a tree because I had read that Louisa May Alcott wrote poetry in a tree when she was a little girl. And um, I, I think I was always born to write, um, frankly, because I don't have very many other skills. <laughs> I can't do math, I always say, um, which is true. I really can't. And um, that was where my inclinations uh, were from the earliest times I can remember. I, I was reading and writing always. When I was 11 years old, I started a neighborhood newspaper because my father brought home a hand-cranked mimeograph machine and put it on the workbench and said, maybe you can do something with this. And my mother, who kept watching me write creatively, kept worrying about how I was going to make a living. <laughs> and so when I was 11, suggested that, you know, perhaps I could be a journalist and work for newspapers during the day, and I could write my poems and stories and other things at night. And what's funny is that's pretty much about how it worked out. Although in the years when I was working as a journalist and as an editor, I didn't have a lot of time for the poems and stories. But even in college, I, was getting deg I got bachelor's degrees in English and journalism and took every creative writing class I could at Sac State, and um, just sort of storing it away. Really had, had no intention at that point of teaching college writing. That was, that was never in the plan. That came later. Um, so I feel really lucky that always I've been sort of pointed in this direction, um, and thankfully encouraged by those parents who were surprised by this um, writer child. <laughs> so who were some of the, the early... Um the early models, either either poets or fiction writers that you loved, or maybe teachers along the way. Mm, lots of them. There's so many. Um, really, my earliest um, poets, I think, that who I was reading were people like uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's children's poems and um, uh, Louisa May Alcott certainly prose. I was a big fan of the Bobsy Twins, though. I, I had my junk fiction even then, and uh, I still do. Um, all kinds of different things. If somebody said, um, read this, I would. My parents, my mother mostly, would drive me and my little sister uh, seven miles into Roseville because we lived that far away from the nearest library to the Carnegie Library. And we would go into the children's section once a week and I would get an armful of books and bring them home. And Mrs. Nelson, the librarian, was always recommending things for me. So I, I know that I had very early exposure to you know, Robert Frost and uh, adult poets uh, who whom I sure I didn't understand, <laughs> but, I, but I really liked a lot. I remember um, the first E.E. E. Cummings poem that I was introduced to as a child was um, the one about the little lame balloon man, Whistles Far and Wee. Um, and I had no idea that I would, in college, discover E.E. E. Cummings' love poems and very wonderful erotic poetry. Um, so there was a lot of uh, early influence um, in those days. And I think I just became a voracious reader. I still am. I read a lot. I read fast. Um, my challenge as I get older is I don't remember it all, but I, uh, you know, I, I stumbled at Emily Dickinson, and like everybody else, didn't understand her. And, and but somewhere along the line, somebody also started introducing me to 20th century poets, particularly women. Um, and I don't remember when I first, you know, came across um, Mary Oliver or Rita Dove or people who are, you know, still within living memory. I do remember in college coming across uh, Lucille Clifton and being so knocked over by her poem to her breast on the eve of a mastectomy, you know. 
I didn't know people could write poems like that. And uh, I love them and have been doing my own versions of my own stories and uh, the, taking on the personas of others ever since. Okay. Um, well, you know, I'd like to read one of your poems. This is from the first edition of your book, uh, Companion Spirit. And this came out, I'm guessing, about 10 years ago. Let's see. It was 2007, maybe? 2006, so eight years, somewhere in there, yeah. And this, of course, was with the uh, Literature, Arts, and Medicine program, the LAMP program at Sutter. And I just came, I was reading through this, and this, this poem really struck me, and I, I'd like to read it because I want, I want to hear your poems, and I thought it might be fun for you to hear it, and mm-hmm. then maybe you can chat about it. This is called Winter Blanket. Every spring I put you away folding you like the heavy winter blanket on my bed. The Hudson Bay wool you used in Alaska, white with fat, red, yellow, and green stripes. Pat the compact bundle there and there. Tuck it away tidily, high in the closet. Close the door. But then you unfold on me in late fall, materializing unexpectedly, and I resist No, no, I shelved you in the dark place. I have no need of you now. Please refold yourself high and away. Sometimes you obey, recede into the darkness and wait, but occasionally I find you spread open, stripes up, lingering on the bed the way you do. So what's uh, what's going on there? What? Well, Companion Spirit um, is now in a second edition, too, published by Amherst Writers and Artists Press in Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, and that po- this, all the poems in that book are love poems to my husband, who died in 2001 after. Um, we were married for 17 and a half years, and he had struggled with heart problems always. Um, and he died very suddenly and unexpectedly in 2001. So um, the Hudson Bay Blankets were really his. <laughs> he was in the Coast Guard in Alaska, and um, they were some of the things that were left behind. And uh, so I thought, uh, as I was putting them away uh, one spring or summer, when it was too warm for them, I thought, there's a good metaphor there. <laughs> and it's right in front of me, literally, on the bed. And, and so I, I put together that poem as, um, that was a late poem, actually, as that book was going um, to press, and so I, I kind of pulled that one together quickly. It's kind of an amazing extended metaphor. I mean, it works so well on so many levels. Thank you. And you know, your um, how it evokes both the the lost love and the winter blanket, the visceral. You know, you see it, you feel it, and so it, you lose you lose the secondary meaning because the the primary meaning is so strong. It's about the blanket. It's about the mm-hmm. blanket, and then. It ain't about the blanket. <laughs> yeah, it's also about something else. It's fun always as a poet to work on more than one level. And, and sometimes, you know, three or four levels, you're doing different metaphorical kinds of things. And for me, I never see them until after the poem is written. People often say, are you trying to do those things? And perhaps some poets do. I'm sure great poets do. Mine often surprise me. And um, people often have to point them out to me, in fact. So I, I, I had a, I had certainly had, had uh, one metaphoric implication there, too, but um, other ones have appeared to me with time. So if, if writing can surprise you, mm. that's something you probably like to see happen in your students. Oh, yeah. Doesn't it happen to all of us? I mean, aren't we always writing to figure out what we're thinking and um, trying to work things out, even if we didn't, weren't consciously aware that we were trying to work them out? I think always. Yeah, and it's one of the wonderful things, even with my composition students, when I offer them creative writing prompts just to see where it goes. I always talk about chasing the poem down the page when I'm writing. And I do this on on the screen now, too. I do it um, on the computer as well as by hand. Um, I have no idea where the poem's going when I start it. I am not one of those people who who works it out in her head first and then puts it down. I've never been able to do that. So the first drafts are always a chance to see where it goes. Now, once there's a draft down, I may change where it goes, or I may um, decide that you know there's some other things going on there. But it is that wonderful, almost blissfully semi-conscious state of just seeing what shows up. And when students experience that, they say, oh, is that what writing is? It's not huh. just finding the thesis statement and putting together the essay. No, I say that's just one kind of writing. And if that's all the writing there was, I wouldn't be writing. <laughs> 
because the five-paragraph essay, God knows, is not my favorite format either, even though I'm an English teacher and I teach composition. But I also teach journalism, so I teach people how to write news stories and feature stories and teach people how to interview folks. I you know, do all kinds of writing. I often talk about flipping switches in my own brain okay, now we're going to write the essay or we're going to write the opinions piece or I actually have to go to work on a feature story for Sacramento Magazine about Hawaii that's due in about a month. (laughs) So I have to flip back on my journalist hat and uh, remember the research I did earlier this year. Um, So it's just, writing is writing. It's just a question of, you know, what kinds of job needs to be done right now. And for me, I think as is true for a lot of creative writing writers, the most fun is just to be able to say, here's a prompt, here's a concept, here's an idea, go. Lately, I've been doing a lot of poetry because when I'm teaching, and as you well know, when we're teaching, we're working way too many hours a week. My brain doesn't seem to have the space to hold a novel, although I do have a first draft of a novel, and there needs to be a second draft coming fairly soon. Um, So I can work on poems and do drafts of poems and let them sit in the journal or type them up. And and, uh, that's something I can get my head around in small bouts. And the bonus for me is that when I have my writing students writing in class, um, and I give them journals at the beginning of the semester. I have 50-cent comp books from Target. And we're all writing in our journals uh, to prompts, uh, or not, writing whatever we want to write. Um, Then I'm getting some writing done. Uh, which is really important. I find that when I'm teaching and if I'm not getting some of my own work done in my writing groups or with my students in class, I get very, very cranky. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what's a good prompt? I mean, we've got a, an audience out there online. What would be a prompt for a composition class or for a poetry class that you feel gets one off on that, that path of, of thinking and discovering? Oh, there's so many. <laughs> First of all, I tell people that um, one of the f- basic place to s- places to start is just to do a brain dump. What's in your head and heart right now? What are you carrying around that you need to get out of you and onto the page so you can go on to something else? Maybe it's how you're feeling about your day or your week or how you've got three things due this week and you just don't know how you're going to get all the work done. Um, when I was the editor of Sacramento Magazine, we had these brand new little Macintosh computers with tiny little screens. I would go into my office every morning before I did anything else, turn on the computer, turn off the screen so I couldn't see it. But I would actually I would call up a, a Word document first, a blank Word document, then turn off the screen and just type, just brain dump. Just, here's what i got to do, here's what I don't want to have to do, here's blah, 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 blah. <laughs> Without looking at the screen. Without looking at the screen. Wow. I would save it yeah. without, without editing it, without doing anything. I'd date, date them all, you know, save it, and then just put it away. Often I never looked at them again. Um, after I left the magazine, I did look at some of those things and went, wow. <laughs> um, there was definitely a pattern there that I should have seen if I'd been paying attention. But if I do a brain dump first, then I can clear, clear the pipes, if you will, for something else to come through. So I often encourage students to start there. And then I'll encourage them to do something very simple, very simple. Um, there's a poem at the beginning of Companion Spirit that's called, What It Comes To Is This which is a great prompt. <laughs> you want to read that one? What it comes to is this. And it can go, sure, it can go anywhere you want it to go. Or the thing is. Or here's the thing. <laughs> and again, that can bring up all kinds of things that we're, are you know, spinning around in our heads and hearts. Sometimes I'll tell people to um, imagine a character, not you, and write something from that character's perspective. Imagine a persona, not you. Um, which I can read later. I I did one earlier this year that I'm kind of pleased with that Thule Review has accepted called Amelia, as in Earhart. Uh, That was kind of fun. And um, uh, the other ones, and this is, (laughs) I I love this one too, Uh, my colleague Tom Miner at Sacramento City College and I uh, used to advise uh, Caesaris, the literary journal at City College that I helped create in uh, 1993. No, it was 1994. And... um, Tom Miner used to give these wonderful, simple prompts. He had an object poem prompt. And it's a very simple format where you begin by brainstorming a list of maybe three objects that have meaning to you. Your your, your sunglasses, your keys, your cell phone, whatever you want. Pick one of them. And then using a very simple format, describe them, working working either um, similes or metaphors in there twice. Right? So you begin by describing the object with three kinds of descriptions, three literal pieces of description. Then you throw in a simile or metaphor. 
write another statement about the object, throw in another simile or metaphor, and end with a statement. It's a very simple, simple uh, format, and people who've never written poetry can do this very easily. And uh, I use that one again and again and again. And the, the things that my students come, and I don't give them very long to do this. I mean, we're talking 10 minutes in class. We're just playing. And uh, the things that come up are just um, delightful and often very funny or very poignant, actually. Unexpected connections. Oh, unexpected. I had a student write one about a backpack, and by the last line it was clear that the backpack was lost or stolen. The backpack had disappeared. <laughs> and what had come before that made it very clear that this kid's life was in that backpack. So it's very interesting to see what comes up. But, yeah, I can read uh, what it comes to is this. It's, it's still one of my favorite prompts. <laughs> and I could write a completely different poem every time about it, too. What it comes to is this. Though we appear to die, we do not. Death is merely a change of address, and loved ones wend their way, like turtles or salmon or whales, by smell, by feel. This morning we do for ourselves, but when we raise our heads, sniff the breeze, feel gaps of air between our ribs. If we give them space, the dead loved ones return. Or maybe they never left. We only think they did when, like snakes, they shed their only skins and belly crawled to the next place, which is the first place, which, when we think about it, is home. Thank you. Um, we're talking with Jan Haig here at Coffee and Poets at Naked Lounge today, May 18th. And um, Jan, you, you mentioned um, you know, the idea of prompts and um, what you're carrying around, which I think is kind of a metaphor. I mean, it's interesting how the prompt itself is a metaphor. Clearing the pipes is a metaphor, and metaphor is part of language. But, but I'm kind of sensing... I mean, it'd be hard. It's not. Doesn't seem fair to talk with you if I don't talk about AWA and Pat Schneider. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about the, the influence and how you've worked with Pat and what you've learned and what you share from that world. Yeah, AWA is, is stands for Amherst Writers and Artists, which is um, an organization that was founded in the early 1980s by a woman named Pat Schneider in Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, Pat was a 40-something-year-old woman going to grad school in English at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst and was getting her stuff, as were all her colleagues, just ripped apart <laughs> by colleagues and by teachers. And she was looking for a supportive kind of writing environment to write in. So with a friend of hers named Margaret Robeson, she gathered together a group of writers one day and decided, we're just going to urge people to write whatever they want and we're not going to criticize them. And uh, the first couple attempts did not go very well, I understand. They, everybody was really uptight and uh, didn't want to read or share their brand new drafts. And uh, finally, Margaret, uh, the story goes, uh, said, I'm just going to bring a bowl of shells the next time and put it on the table. And those were the first tangible prompts, which work really well. And invited people to take a shell or a piece of a shell out of the bowl. And apparently, the story goes, people wrote like angels. And out of that came the AWA method which is a simple, uh, encouraging way to write uh, alone or with others, is the title of Pat's book is Writing Alone and with Others by Pat Schneider. explains the method. Um, the idea is that there's a facilitator who is there to make sure people stay safe and that people are not jumped on in any in inappropriate way. Um, the facilitator offers prompts. Um, the group is free to respond to the prompts or not. You can write whatever needs to be written, we say, in AWA. And then if they like... If they choose to read aloud, all that people are allowed to respond to is what they like, what stays with them, what's strong about the writing, and all work is treated as fiction. So even if someone's writing in first person, I can't, for example, comment on, the, on your grandmother's backyard that I heard in your piece. We talk about the narrator. We presume everything that's written is fiction. And it often is, or it's a mixture of fact and fiction, and we really don't care. We're just going to say to the writer, here's what we think is strong about your piece. Here's what will stay with me. Wow, that image of um, 
the two kids riding their bike along the levee will stay with me. That's all we're going to talk about. So that frees the rider to kind of go anywhere? It does. And then the rider is free to continue to work on that piece. There is a mechanism in the AWA method for critique, but we always start with what we think is strong, what we think is working. And then even in the critiquing method, we're talking, we're asking questions. I wonder if the poem doesn't end earlier. I wonder, you know, oh, okay. um, you know rather than, um, or I'm a little confused about um, who this character is, you know, those kinds of things. And then it's up to the writer to decide what to do about these things. The, the, the idea, Pat says, is that first draft work is like a brand new baby. And it, you would not look at a brand new baby and point out the wart on the baby's nose. <laughs> it's too new. It's, it's, there's no point in that. There's really nothing to be gained for that. And uh, as Pat created workshops in her home and created this international organization, um, she said a, a lot of the people who came to write with her were, were recovering MFAs and PhDs <laughs> who had been terribly beaten up. I came to the AWA method because um, Dr. Lawrence Spann um, brought it to Sutter Hospitals um, in the early 2000s. And um, he wanted to use it for outpatients, uh, particularly in the cancer center, so that anybody in the public was welcome to come write. But the idea is he would give prompts based from literature, often poetry, um, and people could write whatever needed to be written. And those pieces were typically very personal, probably much of them autobiographical, but they were not commented in that way. Um, I came into that process in 2004 um, as a longtime writing teacher and was astonished to see that with nobody teaching, quote unquote, people be taught themselves to be better writers, right? So nobody ever pointed out the great metaphor in their work. They just sort of fell into them and started doing them the more they did it. So people were teaching themselves to write and picking up other things from other people they heard reading that were not, you know, not stealing anybody's work, but I mean techniques and other kinds of things, and they became better writers the more they did it. And this just turned the way I teach writing on its ear. I just thought, oh my gosh, how, what have I been doing all these years? I've been an English teacher who's been beating people up. And saying, well, if you're gonna, if you don't have the thesis statement, you don't have this. It's a C or a D, right? Which is true. And there's there are times when we need to, to be that kind of tough guy English teacher. But people are leave are leaving classes thinking they can't write, and of course they can write. Um, the AWA method believes that everyone has a voice worthy of the page. Um, it may not be a very sophisticated voice. You may not be able to spell or punctuate. But hey, we really don't care at this point if you can spell or, spell or punctuate, because we're not we're not publishing it. We're it's not. You know, it's not ready for prime time. And that's fine. That's fine. And so the, po- the hospital program, unfortunately, was canceled in 2007. But hundreds of people had gone through uh, this, this uh, different workshops with, with Chip, who ran them on a weekly basis. At, at its height, he was running eight workshops a week oh. of at least a couple hours apiece. And Pat Schneider had made a couple of visits to Sacramento, so we had met her. Um, he was running a press, which was the literature arts and medicine press that you mentioned earlier that published my first uh, uh, edition of Companion Spirit, um, and published tw- uh, like a dozen books, including an anthology of writing from the Sutter Writers Program. And I helped edit that program. Uh, that anthology is called Blood on the Page, which I love. Um, and uh, when that kind of fizzled in 2007, a colleague of mine who was leading workshops in the hospital, John Crandall, and I said we got to keep this going. And uh, by that time, I had had the great uh, good fortune to create a class at City College called Writing as a Healing Art, which is just a class for generating writing using the AWA method. Um, uh, UCD Extension, which then had a writing program, asked me to do a version of that class, and we called it the Art of Expressive Writing. And so that ran that way. And then a bunch of us just started um, doing you know, private writing workshops you know, on our own. There are still actually two free workshops in town through Sutter Hospitals um, in the Sutter Resource Library, which is now across the street from Sutter General Hospital. John Crandall runs one on Tuesday nights. Our friend Marie Reynolds runs one on Fridays. And they're still free and open to the public. Um, a number of people also have workshops for which they charge in town. Um, but our, we'd like to say that if anybody wants to write in the AWA method, we'll find a place for you to work, uh, to, to write. So a lot of people are doing these, uh, are leading these workshops, people who have gone through specific training through AWA. I, in fact, I'm one of the instructors for AWA. I'm go do, I'll go do a training in a couple weeks in Southern California for them. Um, it's being used in the school system. And in fact, Katie McCleary's 916 Inc., uses the AWA method. I wow. trained her a number of years ago, and she's taken that into um, from little kids through high school kids in a variety of, of settings around town. So there's a number of 916 Inc. 
uh, groups using the method. So I, I, I can't help but be thrilled that out of this little program that uh, Pat started in Amherst and Lawrence brought to Sacramento, um, you know, on any given week, there are hundreds, literally hundreds of people in writing groups, um, especially during the school year, um, writing using the AWA method and finding their voices as writers, putting down whatever they need to say. And Sacramento has, a, I think, a pretty large contingent of AWA poets and writers. Mm-hmm. I mean, it seems like a lot of people came out of that program, and it's still growing. Yeah, a lot of people who didn't think they were, or who didn't think of themselves as writers, that's for sure. Um, it is growing, um, but frankly, some people go to, you know, maybe they'll come to an AWA group like mine for a few months or a year, and then they'll go off and do something completely different. That's fine. You know, it's, um, I, I really think of it as writer empowerment okay. <laughs> more than anything else, and I teach that way now in my classes. Every writing class I teach, I teach the AWA method, and they write in small groups and share with each other, um, only talking about what they like, what stays with them, what's strong. Um, I really want people leaving my classes, I don't care if they're journalism or comp classes or creative writing, feeling more confident as writers, feeling better about their voices. Well, that's so huge with young writers or Mm -hmm. people who come to college and need help with writing. I see that they just, you know, oh, I don't, I I can't write, I don't like writing. I hear that over and over. And so confidence building is is so important and so that's it sounds like a great process I think I'm mean, after the interview I think I'm going to have to learn some more tips <laughs> it's really not rocket science I mean uh, what Pat said from the beginning is you can take the book writing alone with others and read the principles and learn how to keep a group safe and like I said there are actual formal trainings through AWA um, but it's it's not rocket science it's it's a very gentle encouraging method it's sometimes criticized people think that all you guys do is tell each other what you like um, and in, initially, that's true. That's that's right. Um, but like I said, there is a mechanism for critique and for um, uh, delving into pieces more deeply, uh, both in a group setting and, and alone. And AWA Press does um, publish a bunch of books. I'm also the editor of AWA Press now. And um, um, so, so believe me, the books that get published through AWA Press get a very thorough editing, um, in just as they would with through any other small press. So tell me a little bit about that. Um you know, kind of turning the corner from the expressive side to the critical side. What mm. what is it that you think makes a poem work, or makes a makes a piece or a book work? Wow, that's a big question. Um, I think I'm always looking for um, first of all a, an authentic voice on the page. I want um, things to be very clear and accessible. I, I like a lot of. Um, I guess 20th, 21st century writers. I'm want, I, I, I'm looking for something that I can uh, dive into as a reader, so that there, there's not a lot of abstract language that keeps me at arm's length from the from the work that's in front of me, whether it's poetry or prose. Um, you know, I as an as a as an old journalist and as an old journalistic editor, I'm always looking to tighten up lines of poetry if if possible. But again, not not messing too much with the writer's voice. I was when I was the editor of Sacramento Magazine. It was really important to me to, uh, when I was editing people's stories, that their voices were still left on the page. There, there wasn't just it wasn't just edited into some universal generic voice. And I think that's still true, uh, whether I'm looking at poetry or prose. Um, and just to say, um, you know, is that the metaphor you want, or is that where you really want the piece to land at the end? Um, lately, I've been using the word sticking the landing. I'm hearing all kinds of people in my writing groups. Man, they're, in the first draft, I mean, it's like, wow, that, you know, the ending, that last line, you really, stick, you really stuck the ending like a gymnast. <laughs> um, and that's always amazing. That doesn't mean things shouldn't change or won't change. But it's just a question of going over it with the writer and saying, you know, what, you know, what else could we do here? Is this what you really want? Um, some people, uh, I, uh, I've got somebody I'm working with right now. Is he's such a good poet? I'm, I'm, I'm not going to be editing him much at all. I may ask a question about a line or a clarification, or, um, but there's, it's going to be a very light hand. Um, and uh, I, I don't take on editing projects where I have to do heavy duty lifting anymore because I just, <laughs> I'm just too busy. I do a lot of, you know, other kinds of things. In fact, I don't edit people's books anymore except for. Uh, dear close friends and people I love because I just don't have the time. I'd love to. I just don't have the time. And um, so you are publishing, right? You're the head of, I heard that kind of slipped it in there, the head of AWA Press. Pub- press. Yeah, right. Press. It, um, the Press has been inactive for a few years, but uh, there's a literary journal that comes out of AWA called Peregrine that we're going to put together this year. 
there has not been any money to publish Peregrine for the last couple of years, so there's a little bit of money to put one together. So I hope to have a Peregrine out by fall. That's an international journal. People send in work from all over, and we choose it just like any other literary journal. Um, and yes, we publish uh, small books of poetry, like Companion Spirit and uh, other things. Um, Pat Schneider and I basically, Pat's still the publisher of AWA Press. I'm the editor. And uh, so when she has projects or I have projects that we want to do, we're, we're doing them. It's a cooperative press. AWA doesn't really have a lot of money. So frankly, the author does have to kick in for some <laughs> to, to help get the thing printed, honestly. Um, so it's, that's not ideal. Funding would be a great thing at some point, too. So I hope to be able to do it long enough to make it a quote-unquote real press <laughs> where we could actually you know, provide all the money to publish a journal and perhaps even give Hello, the writer, a little bit. Right now, the, uh, the, the deal is that um, people help kick in for the printing, or they do kick in for the printing, and, and uh, they get most of what comes back from their books, um, and with a little bit going to AWA to help fund Peregrine and some other projects. So. Sounds like a good cause. Thanks. I think so. How about a, another poem, maybe? Okay. Do you want one? Let's see, a, new, a newer one, maybe? Something new, yeah. Um, let's see. I just had... Um, <laughs> I don't send poems out very often because I don't have a lot of time for doing that, but I just um, had a poem published um, on the Grammar Girl website. <laughs> uh-huh. I don't know if you know Grammar Girl. She's, uh, her name is Mignon Fogarty, and uh, a couple of months ago, she, um, I guess maybe it was in April during Poetry Month, she uh, put out on, the, on her uh, newsletter blog that uh, she was having a poetry contest for people who wanted to write poems that had something to do with punctuation or grammar. And much to my embarrassment, I do have a series of punctuation poems. Um, And so um, this poem called Semicolon was the second runner-up in her contest, which means third place. (laughs) And it was published on the website. I started started writing uh, poems about punctuation because it sort of is a joke to explain to my students. I teach a class at City College in Associated Press style and grammar for journalism students. Um, And... um, you know, commas, as you well know, I don't have to tell you this, Bob, commas and semicolons are mystifying to a lot of people and how to use them. And so um, the semicolon poem uh, kind of showed up. And then it, as these poems do, as I chase them down the page, turn into something else. So this is semicolon. You can get through your whole life without one, I tell my students. Periods and commas will do you fine if you use them correctly. If you resist the urge to polka dot a page or sprinkle them through a field of letters like so many chocolate chips. If a period puts a button on the end of a sentence, halts a declaration, and a comma serves as a mere pause, when you combine them, that simple dot over a curvy parenthesis, you arrive at the spot dividing two complete thoughts. It creates parallels. It speaks of relationship. Your road running next to mine, each of us equals, holding our own weight in this lovely dance of a sentence together. So who knew? Semicolon is a love poem. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) That was not what I thought I was going to write. Billy Collins says that a poem should be like a horse that you're riding and you think to some degree you're controlling it and to some degree it's controlling you. It's taking you somewhere else. And if it doesn't go somewhere, then it really isn't a poem. I so agree with that. (laughs) I I, I want to be surprised at the end of a poem, whether it's mine or reading someone else's. And boy, Billy Collins does that masterfully, doesn't he? Lots and lots of poets do. I want to be surprised by anything I read, whether it's prose or poetry and, and uh, or that lovely little in-between thing called the prose poem. I always want to be surprised. We watched a video last night that was too predictable, and at the end, my wife and I were just like, why did we waste all that time? <laughs> it was just like, we knew where it was going. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, you do like to be surprised. Always, yeah. yeah. That's, I think, I really, I mean, sir, sure, we're writing to find out what we're thinking, but we're I don't. I didn't even know I was thinking that most of the time, but I had no idea where the piece was going to go. I, you know, I've written a whole novel, little scene by little scene, in the writing groups, in my own writing groups. It took me a year and a half to do it, and they weren't the scenes weren't written sequentially. They were, you know, just jumbled. And then later, I had to go back and organize them. And when I had about 150 pages of miscellaneous scenes, I started organizing. And I went, "Oh, that's what this book's about." 
And then I could go back and, you know, do some other work around that. But, um, I, yeah, don't we always write to be surprised? You know, um, it was Robert Frost. And Pat Schneider loves to quote this, no surprise in the writer, no surprise in the reader, right? Um, very true. So, so what about the novel? Oh, the novel. That, I love talking about the novel. Actually, I have two novels. One is out with a, uh, an agent, has been for more than a year now. God bless Amy Tipton. Thank you, Amy. Um, it's Amy, a young, are it's you a, listening, Amy? <laughs> <laughs> she's in Idaho, so probably not. Um, she, uh, the, the, that novel is called Ocean Falls, and it's set in a real Canadian, uh, British Columbian uh, enclave called Ocean Falls that was a paper and pulp mill town for 80 years until the Canadian government basically came in and closed the mill and began destroying the town. The town still exists in a, some small way, but it's a shadow of its former self. And that novel is told from the point of view of a 17-year-old girl who's never been out of her town. You can, you can only get to Ocean Falls, even to this day, either by floating in by boat or flying in on a float plane. And I'm fortunate to say that I've been there four so times. it's a real place. It's a real place, okay. yeah. Uh, that's a young adult novel that's out being shopped. What surprised me is the current novel is, is set in Sacramento in the 1950s and the 1970s. And it's called uh, Three Sisters Antiques. And um, it's about these three girls who come together to be sisters in a blended family, although they, long before they were called that in the 1950s. Um, it's not based on people I know or anything historic, except that I'm using a lot of real-life places in Sacramento. I can show you the house where my girls grew up on H Street, because um, it's in my head. <laughs> I mean, it's, I actually found a house that we're just on the description. H Street right now. Yeah, we're yeah. on H Street. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it's not too far. That may be about... Eight blocks uh, east of us. Um, and um, so it's a story, these, these girls coming together, and it's t- the 1950s scenes are told from um, uh, the oldest girl, Caro, which is short for Carolyn, looking back and reminiscing about their childhood. And the 1970s pieces are set when Caro, as a adult, young adult, is uh, living back at home with her mom on H Street. Uh, her first marriage has gone kaput. The middle daughter... Uh, is coming home from a convent after having been a nun for many years. And uh, it turns out that the youngest daughter died in a car accident when she was 16. And this all sort of comes out over the course of the novel and about how the family was really only a family for 10 years. And they're coming together, and uh, it all blew apart. Um, and uh, the father has died, and, um, and now they're coming back together in the 70s as, as grown-ups. Uh, it's, it's, it's really been a lot of fun and, and interested to, to see how that novel comes up. Um, I got a pregnant nun coming home from a convent. I got without a, you know, not sure if the father of this child is going to show up. Um, and uh, Carol, my protagonist, uh, I am proud to say, is a waitress at the Pancake Circus when the novel begins. And so I have had to do a lot of research at the Pancake Circus. And I, uh, it's, it's been fun to, to be able to look at those kinds of you use these locations of, that, uh, of the town and the city that I love so much and where I live now. So it's been great fun. So how do you like the process of writing a novel versus the process of, of creating poems? Um, they're, to me, they're similar animals. It's just um, uh, in that you, know, you just uh, put your fingers on the keyboard or um, put a pen to a page, and, and, and often they came out of prompts that I would give the writing groups, right? I would say what it comes to is this, and I would try to have Caro's voice in my head since she's the person telling that story, and I just see what shows up. Um, and so it, it, it's a very similar kind of process. Um, the great thing about novel characters, or maybe not so great, depending on how you, <laughs> you look at it, is, boy, they stay in your head for a long time. <laughs> so, I mean, I've spent big parts of my life walking around with, you know, people in my head talking to me, <laughs> which is great because uh, then you, I sometimes feel like I'm just transcribing. Um, other times it's, uh, you know, it's just, um, uh, frankly, work to... Um, once I've got some scenes put together to try to figure out how to organize them, do I have too much of this, not enough of that? What, you know, do I need some transitions? Right now I need to do some research about, about how, how, uh, how nuns and uh, priests really did leave their vocations in the 70s. You know, was it very easy? Was it not very easy? And, um, and then I have these, this antique store that kind of popped out of nowhere in this novel. My grandma was an antiques collector and worked in antique stores, had her own shop for years in Southern California, but I was too little. I don't know much about that. So the novel for me allows me allows the journalist in me to go out and do some research. It was great fun to travel to Ocean Falls, British Columbia, four times and be on the ground and talk to people who had lived in that town. 
um, and do research that I could then incorporate into the novel. So um, I have spent um, a fair amount of time, and I'll need to spend more this summer in the um, the city archives uh, for Sacramento, looking up things and um, especially things going back to the fifties that I wasn't here for. <laughs> so I was born in the fifties, but I was living in Southern California at the time. So it's great fun. Um, there there are two delightful processes and. Uh, um, I wouldn't do it if it wasn't fun. I have to say that. <laughs> it sounds, in a way, that it uh, it incorporates you know two sides. I mean, you, you said early on that uh, you were a right brain person in a left brain family, but in yeah. order to be a teacher, a journalist, I'm sure there are organizational skills, and you like you like building things that are larger than you know. The poem is is almost like a like one aspect or one piece. So it sounds yeah. like you get to. You get to play with words, but you get to build something that's bigger. Yeah, good point. My What I've said for years is that I had to grow a left brain. I still can't do math, but I had to grow enough of a left brain to be organized enough to be a teacher, to organize a novel, to um, you know get through life, frankly, <laughs> to pay my bills and run a household and all that kind of stuff. But um, And every so often I'll go on the Internet and I'll take those tests, those right brain, left brain, creative side, practical side things, and... As I've gotten older, I'll be 56 this summer, um, it, I, I'm astonished that those little tests, and who knows how accurate, accurate they are, say that I'm kind of in the middle now. That's astonishing to me. I used to be a very um, kind of airy-fairy, spacey kind of gal. <laughs> and, uh, and it was hard for me to actually organize things um, but, you know, frankly, the journalistic training was terrific. I worked for United Press International covering the Capitol here, covering the legislature here in town. And I would have to go into a, a meeting or a hearing and gather information in 20 minutes and 10 minutes dictated over the phone. And that was hard for me. That was really difficult for me in my, my uh, late 20s and early 30s. But, again, I had to grow that left brain to do that, and it served me very well. So I'm, I'm very grateful. Yeah, the novel is a bigger organizational challenge but in the beginning I'm just writing scenes it's like you know it's like first date man it's just great fun <laughs> who are these people and what are they doing and what's happening to them and uh, that's just joy you know the, like I said the work comes in when I have to organize it and figure out what you know what, what holes need to be plugged and what happens next so that leads me to my next question which would be uh, what happens next you've got you got your publishing books for AWD, AWA. You're still teaching. You're writing poems. You're writing a novel. What's what's your biggest project? What's something that you just would love to see happen in your world of, of creating words? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, you know, for years I said when I retired uh, as a teacher, uh, as a professor from Sac City. I would um, like to, you know, just publish my friend's books, and I still think that's true. I think it's very, very difficult to get things published. I have no idea if Ocean Falls will have, find a home. I'm probably up to over 20 rejections now. And the rejections are all something like lovely writing, great literary fiction. We don't know how to sell that. Um, I think that's sad, but true, and I get it. Um, and frankly, if that book, um, you know, doesn't see the light of day in a great way, that's okay. I had fun writing it. I might publish it through AWA Press eventually. Um, if I have to, I might not. Um, so, you know, if, for me, publishing my own books is not nearly as important to me as helping other people get their work out into the world, I have to say. Um, I'm writing them just to, you know, write the books or write the poems for, you know, for my own enjoyment. So I don't have a grand plan, I, I have to tell you. Um, except that I love doing the writing groups. And I see myself doing writing groups long after I retire from teaching, but who knows? We'll see. Um, I always say if the, the ship comes in and a lot of money shows up and I get to retire tomorrow, <laughs> what would I do? Um, I'd probably continue doing writing groups and, 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 and writing and publishing and, and really trying to publish people. I think um, so many people feel like they're not writers until they're published. And um, I haven't had the, really the time I, that AWA Press deserves to get some of the projects published that I promised people, and I need to put some time into that, too. Um, I guess I'm a forever teacher. I'm a forever encourager. I'm a, um, I, I, I have a lot of fun watching people around me um, write stuff and see what's there and, and read if they want or publish if they wish, although I don't think publishing is the be-all, end-all that a lot of folks think it is. Um, but 
the idea that everybody has something to say and everybody has, has something to put out there in the world in whatever way they want to put it out through a podcast like this, perhaps, um, uh, at readings or um, maybe just in the privacy of their own writing space is really important to me. And, and, the, and the longer I do this, the more I realize that's probably my mission <laughs> for the rest of this lifetime anyway, is to encourage that in people and to say, your voice matters. Your voice matters a lot. My voice matters too, but no more than yours. No more than yours. No more than anybody else's. Um, and it's you don't just have to be famous to be considered a writer. You don't have to have something published to be considered a writer. It drives me crazy that often people say, when they hear that you're a writer, what have you published? That's the first thing they ask. Um, the act of writing is doing it. That's the whole thing. Publishing is a separate thing, and that's fine. Um, it's delightful, and it's a bonus. But... Um, for the joy of writing, for the joy of creating, or painting, or composing music, or playing music, or whatever art form you do, or art forms you do, I'm hoping people do more than one, um, that's, that's, that's everything to me. I remember the first time I heard your name, we were at the Caesaris reading, it was probably about ten years ago, and people were actually chanting your name, because they were, so, uh, they were just so thrilled and so glad for the work that you had done. Um, in shepherding that that, that uh, publication at City College, and they were you know, it was like Jan Haig, Jan Haig, <laughs> and it was and I was like, who is this woman? It was, it was like Mother Teresa or something. Um, and what you just said, I thought was was very very eloquent and and rich. You know, kind of uh, a mission, a mantra, kind of a way of looking at the world that uh, that speaks to that. And uh, it, you know, helps me understand. I mean, I've understood that. That's why I'm happy to have you here today. But mm. uh, really, um, it's just an honor to uh, to have you here. We're we're lucky to have you here in Sacramento, as you know, and doing all these things you do. Why don't maybe you could close with a with one more piece, just something sure. that pops into your head. Sure, something that pops into my head. That's the okay. You want you want a goal for life? I'd like to be able to memorize some of my own poems. <laughs> I'm. <laughs> I, I am so impressed by people who can yes. do that, but I just don't have the brain capacity to do that, I don't think, anymore. Um, I think I'll, 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 I'll read Amelia, which is a poem I mentioned earlier, and apparently the Thule Review has accepted. Thank you, SPC and the Thule Review. I, I need to say that, too. Thank you, Bob, for all that you do in this town and um, for Sacramento Poetry Center. And, and yes, let's applaud for Bob. Yes. Yes. Um, I, I've, you know, I remember when I was in college and the Sacramento Poetry Center was flourishing, and I would not have gone and read or, uh, you know, had the nerve to do that. It seemed like other people were the were the poets and the and the important people. And I think one of the great things about Sacramento and the writing scene here in the last dozen or fifteen years is how democratized it's become, and it, it, that in no small part is is due to you and your leadership of SPC and and, and encouraging so many people. To um, to read and do things and publish and making the space available to so many people. So I I truly am grateful to you and I'm also very happy to be one of your colleagues when we're lucky enough to have you teaching at City. Thank you. So this is called Amelia. And by the way, I um I don't I most everything in here is truly fictional. I have no idea if any of this is if any of this is uh, accurate. But it's a good story. Amelia. My mother said I was riveted by birds when I was tiny, that she would hold me close to her, next to the window for long minutes. My blue eyes, not yet dusky gray, captivated by wings and beaks and tail feathers on the feeder, my hands reaching for them, my lips pursed, trying to tweet. I loved the big crow that made its home in the tall pole of pine at the back of the yard, swooping to the deck railing to deftly pluck peanut after peanut mother left there, me squealing with delight every time, touch and go, flap away with a throaty caw, never dropping the nut. Of course I would fly. I learned at that window, as a girl watching the flat-faced barn owl arrow in on a field mouse, invisible to me until its little feet squirmed below wicked talons. 
I learned from proud robins strutting the lawn, poking for worms, coming up triumphant, and gobbling the gooey things. Then, fueled, lifting gracefully into mere air, aloft after one wingbeat, higher after two. I learned from hummingbirds helicoptering around the glass feeder, sipping ruby nectar mother left for them year-round, their beady eyes never leaving mine behind the sheet of glass. Of course I would fly. I was never afraid, though others were for me, though I heard men postulate about the hubris of Icarus, or that women should keep their feet on the ground. I was born with wings. I was grounded far too long. Of course I would fly. Even at the end, I was not lost. There was no fall. No, we soared. We glided into a sky of silken flame, of scarlet desire, faith in flight. And yes... There were birds, a long V of cormorants, black, long-necked sentinels just off the left wing, ready for the dive, flying us home. That's the poem Amelia by Jan Haig. And uh, we've been talking with Jan for the last hour or so here at Coffee Coffee and Poets at... uh, 11th and H in Sacramento. Our producer is Lawrence Dinkins. Uh, thanks to Jan. Let's hear it for Jan Haig. Wonderful. Thank you. And uh, I hope we can keep continuing this conversation. So thanks to all. Uh, I'm Bob Stanley, and thanks for coming to Naked Lounge. <laughs>